All right, so we have been attending to the book of Esther and the topic of fearful obedience. What does it mean when we live in a world that requires us to be obedient to God even when it's fearful? even when we're frightened. We are gonna do a quick recap of where we've been. We're gonna talk about the characters we've studied. It's been a character-driven study. If this is your first um, first week with us, you're gonna be like, what just happened? Because it's gonna feel like a quick recap and a final punch, and we're sorry for that, but come back. We start a new series next week. But um, the book of Esther was really defined by characters, and we'll start with Queen Vashti. Queen Vashti was the queen of, um, of the Persian Empire. She was... Uh, uh, deposed from her throne by King Xerxes. She was deposed because Xerxes held a banquet and got drunk for 187 days and then wanted to show off his hot wife to his friends. She said no, and he deposed her of the throne. Seems like a good guy, not so much. But she was someone who was worth more than what she looked like, and she knew it, and she was like, no, you're not just going to look at me. I'm a person, and it cost her her throne. So we studied Queen Vashti over on the far left. Then there's this uh, kind of dark and ominous character of Haman. Haman was someone who hated the Jews. He hated specifically Mordecai, who is the one over uh, from Esther there in the middle. Uh, Mordecai and Haman were not friends. Mordecai was, or Haman was the most powerful and influential noble in the, in the kingdom of Xerxes, which was vast, and we'll talk about that. It was an amazingly massive empire, and he was really the number two in it. And he sought to destroy and almost accomplished the destruction of the Jewish people. Then you have Esther, who is right in the middle there, and she is the young Hebrew queen who is both obedient and brave and willing to do what it takes to to be an agent of salvation to the people of God in their time of need. Next to her is Mordecai, her adoptive father. He would have been her uncle. She was an orphan, and he adopted her. Mordecai is the faithful Hebrew who would not bow down to Haman and was willing to risk much in order that he was faithful to God. And finally, we have Xerxes, who's over on the far right there, and he was the king over the Persian Empire, 127 provinces, went from India to Turkey, to modern-day Turkey, was a vast empire, many languages, many peoples, and this is kind of the characters we've studied. But there is one character who goes unnamed throughout the entire book of Esther. The character that goes unnamed is the character of God. God is not mentioned one time in this book of the Bible. Not one time in the book of Esther, but we must unpack the role of God in this story. And one of the reasons we must do it and one of the ways we're going to do it is because God reveals in this story some of his traits. Now, if you have traits, you, you know how to know somebody, the sound of their voice or the way that they, you know, like Erica and I will be at home, we hear someone walk by and we know which one of our children that is walking by. The, just their stride is a trait. We, we get to see the traits of God in this. So what we're going to do is we are going to look at what happens because in this story, it starts with the Vashti all the way up through where Mordecai is really exalted to Haman's former position of second in charge. But what happens in between is a holocaust. It's just about, I mean, they get on the verge of a holocaust, and God intervenes. And we have to ask the question, what are the traits of God? And what does God reveal of himself in this book to tell us and give confidence to us as the people of God in the lives we live. Who does God reveal himself to be even though he goes unnamed? Today, our last character in the study of Esther is God. We're gonna read from the text. Esther chapter eight says, King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther and they have impaled him on the pole he set up. It's always a nice way to start church, isn't it? So um, he's been impaled now Write another decree in the king's name on behalf of the Jews as seems best to you. Seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. At once the royal secretaries were summoned. The, on the 23rd day of the third month, the month of Sivan, they wrote out all of Mordecai's orders to the Jews and to the satraps, governors, and nobles of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. These orders were written in the script in the language of each province and the language of each people and also to the Jews in their own script and language, Hebrew. 
Mordecai wrote in the name of King Xerxes, sealed the dispatches with the king's signet ring, and sent them by mounted couriers who rode fast horses, especially bred for the king. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and to protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them, their women, and their children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. Sounds a lot like the Exodus, doesn't it? Remember when they leave Egypt and God gives to them all the wealth and plunder of Egypt? We find ourselves there today. So we have to ask the question, when the story got so dark and so dire that the king Xerxes, who gives Mordecai this freedom to write this new declaration, had also given Haman the right to write a a decree to annihilate all the Jews just days before, just weeks before. What's going on and where do we see God at work and what are the traits of God that should give comfort to us? So real quick, before we we go into this, I, I I want you to understand what you're about to experience in the next about 20 minutes. Anybody here ever gone water skiing? Anybody a water skier? A few of us. The rest of them are up north and let's judge them in our hearts for a minute. Okay, all right, so um, when you're water skiing, if you're like, hit it, and you just sit there, what's going to happen? You're like, whoosh, and you get kind of drug out of your skis. I remember when I was young, I tried to learn to go to ski off the beach, coil the rope up, and you throw it in the air. When it pulls tight, you hop. Do you know how many times I got jerked out of my ski and landed in my face, on my face in water about that deep, you know, trying to learn? Because when you say hit it, the boat takes off, and if you're not holding on tight and in the right position, it kind of, woof, yanks you forward. We're about to hit it, and we're going to hit a lot of scriptures, and we're going to talk about the characteristics that identify God in this story, and we're going to do so at great speed. So get a grip, buckle up, and stick with me. Fair enough? Super excited about this. All right, so what we're going to see is the first trait of God is that he's sovereign. And you're like, but why are we looking at a scripture from Isaiah? We're going to look at scriptures from Psalms, from, uh, from Romans, and a few different places to do one thing, allow scripture to interpret scripture. We're going to let the voice of scripture prove the traits of God true in this story. We see God as sovereign. Isaiah would say it this way, I make, that God says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say that my purposes will stand, and I will do all that I please. And you think, okay, God, how does that work in the book of Esther? How do you make know the, known the end from the beginning? Remember Vashti? She was this queen who was young and beautiful and powerful, and she's deposed, and you may think she's just a side story, but she's not. She's the first great puzzle piece in God's grand plan to make known the end from the beginning because the critical role of what happens in the book of Esther starts with the vacancy in the queen's throne. Without Vashti being out of the way, Esther would have never been placed for such a time as this. God is making known the end from the beginning. When you look at the vacancy and removal of Vashti, we see that God is already doing something. We who know the whole story recognize that God's hand was over this situation. Vashti seems like a bit player, but she is not. She is critical, and I would say her act of defiance to Xerxes was probably a spiritual obedience to something inside of her that says you are worth more than what you look like. So we can look and see that God is sovereign even over sovereign kings and queens. God is sovereignly in control of what's going on, even in the opening scenes of the book of Esther. And then you turn and you go, okay, but if God's sovereign and he's this massive, overpowering, all sovereign God, I mean, that's a little intimidating, isn't it? But what if we also can see that God is invested and God is caring. And, and we look at Psalm 1, um, 121, verse 3, and it says, He will not let your foot slip, and he who watches over you won't slumber. Anybody here ever fallen asleep at the wrong time? Yeah, isn't it the worst? And if you make the neck noise, you're like, Argh. Everybody looks, you're like, sorry, <clears throat> hairball. I, I don't know what happened. That guy next to me is sleeping. You know, because you don't want to admit you fell asleep. And we who get tired so easily can fall asleep and slumber and lose watch and not do what we're supposed to do. Isn't it nice to know that we serve a God who is invested and caring and his unblinking eye is fixed on his people? And his purpose is for us are things he's not only sovereign over, but he's invested and caring. Psalmist goes on to say, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? 
human beings that you would care for them. It tells us this, that God is invested and he is caring. And we can see this in the life of Esther. She was an orphan, but she wasn't just an orphan. She was an orphan born in a land she's not from. She was born in Persia, but she's a Hebrew girl from Israel. She's a fourth generation exile. But did God not care and invest in her life? Her uncle Mordecai was a man of honor and integrity, and God put him in her life, and he was invested in Esther's life. Even in the tragedies, God was bringing all things together for good, and what we can recognize in this is God is invested in caring even in the chaos of Esther's life. Esther, even in the basic things, she was beautiful in form and feature, and you think, what does that matter? Well, it mattered to Xerxes that she was good looking. That's all there is to it. God was taking care of putting her in the right place and making her what he wanted her to be. He was invested, and then there's this heart matter. He was caring for her. He cared about the outcome of Esther's days and what happened. And that's critical to this story that we understand it. But then we go on to this next thing. But God is also, remember sovereign's way up here and then invested in caring is very intimate. Then God's also back up here. He's not bound by our circumstances. Anybody here, no, you don't have to raise your hand, but I know you're here. You feel bound by circumstances. Maybe you're broke. Maybe you're in debt. Maybe your marriage is in the tank. Maybe you're addicted. Maybe you're just hurting. Maybe you're deeply unsatisfied in work and in life. Maybe you're miserably, deeply depressed. I don't know, but your circumstances seem to swallow you whole, and you're bound by your circumstances. The best news I have to you today is that we are not bound by our circumstances because we serve the God of heaven. Esther was not bound by her circumstances. Paul writes it this way, for I am convinced neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What we recognize in this is that Esther is not bound by her circumstances. She's in a situation where they are going to annihilate all of her people, and she would have been the last living Jew in the Persian Empire. She would have been the last one. And what seems like sure destruction is actually God's path to salvation because God is not bound by human circumstance. He is God over them. And our circumstances don't own God. Therefore, they should not own the people of God. The joy and salvation of the Jews that would come in the empire of Persia came out of the darkest possible situation. In Esther chapter 8, verses 15, it says this. This is after everything, after God has conquered some things. It says, when Mordecai left the king's presence, he was wearing royal robes of blue and white, a large crown of gold and a purple robe of fine linen. And the city of Susa, the capital, held a joyous celebration for the Jews. It was a time of happiness, joy, gladness, and honor. In every province and in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because of the fear of them had fallen on them. Think about that. They were going to be annihilated. And the circumstances said, this is where you hit the panic button. But what does God do? God takes circumstances and is Lord over them. God is Lord over the circumstances and not bound by them. But there's also this nature of God that says he's also just. God believes in justice. He doesn't just save Esther and save Mordecai and save the Jews. He actively goes against those who seek to harm his people. He goes against them. And what we have to do in this is understand that what Paul says is don't repay evil for evil. Vengeance is God's and let him have it. And you think, I don't want to let God have it. I want to have my vengeance and I want to eat it too. I want mine, right? We get that way. But what we see in the book of Esther is this amazing moment where God turns everything upside down. Remember Haman. This dark, evil kind of picture of a Holocaust creator. He's ready to annihilate the Jews. Remember what happens last week with Haman? Haman goes to the king, and the king says, 
I would like to honor somebody. What should I do? Haman was number two. He's like, yes, finally I'm going to get mine. So he tells the king, put your clothes on him, give him your horse, give him a crown, and make a noble person lead him through the streets on a horse shouting, this is what happens to the man the king wishes to honor. And what happens? God says, great, or uh, King Xerxes says, great idea to to, um, Haman. Now go do that for Mordecai. Devastating, right? It says this in, um, and I believe it's in chapter um, seven of Esther, where Mordecai comes back after leading, or yeah, Mordecai and Haman come back, and Haman has led him through the town square, saying, This guy's more loved than me, basically, by the king. And when he gets done, he covers his, Haman covers his head in shame and runs home and flops on the couch. <laughs> Woe is me. But he doesn't know what's coming next. Let's do that. Let's read that. I always love a good ending here. So it says this. Afterwards, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Worst day ever. But here's then what happens. In 7, 7 and 8, it says, Um, There it is. The king, um, so then Haman, after Esther confronts him, was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, and he left his wine and went out 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 into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, he stayed behind to beg the queen Esther for his life. Okay, no fans of irony. All right, so that's fine. So he's like begging a Hebrew, please save me. Please save me. He tried to annihilate them all. He's begging, please save me. Just um, And so he begs her for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. This is where things go from really, really bad to super bad for him. He says, the king exclaims, will he even molest the queen while I'm in the room? You're like, oh, you're, you're dead. X over the eyes, right? It's over for him. Then he takes Haman. He has him impaled on the pole that he set up for that Haman set up for Mordecai, and all the sons of Haman are impaled. God is just, and we see it in this. God is just, and vengeance is His. We have to recognize that if God is not bound by our circumstances, He's also not bound to our definition of justice, and God will work out righteously what is His to work out. We must trust in His character. And finally, God keeps his promises. God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he, does his, does he promise and not fulfill? No. God speaks and acts. God promises and fulfills. The irony of this scripture out of Numbers is that it comes from a place where the, um, in the ancient tribe of Israel, in the book of Numbers, when they're in the desert, there's a story of Balaam. He's an oracle. He's a prophet. And um, a, a person who hates the Israelites hires him to curse the Israelites. Balaam goes up to curse the Israelites and ends up blessing them with this. And asks, does the promises of God, not are they not fulfilled? Meaning, yeah, it's rhetorical. They are. The promises of God are absolutely fulfilled. And what we see in the book of Esther, in Esther chapter 9, is that we see God keeps his promises. Not just to the people he promises, but to their sons and daughters centuries later. God keeps his promises. In Esther chapter 9, verse 20, what we find is Mordecai is sitting at the right hand of the king, and he declares a day of Purim is what it's called. And Purim is a day of celebration and feasting for the people of God to celebrate God's bringing relief to them in their time of need. God brought relief to his people in their time of need. God kept his promises from ancient days in their current days. And it makes you and I ask the question, what do we do with a sermon like this? How does this sermon live into our lives? What makes sense for us What does this mean for you and I today? I think it applies very uniquely and very well because we are the people of God. And if he is sovereign, he knows this, that on Tuesday, some of your babies are going to school for the first time, and he will watch over them. And he knows that they're scared. He knows that you're scared. He knows the answers to the things we don't. He is sovereign. He knows the results of whatever test you're either going to take or whatever test the doctor holds in his hand. 
He knows the diagnosis. He knows the outcome. He is sovereign, and we can trust him. He knows how we deal with success. So maybe he doesn't give us too much of it. And he knows how we deal with failure. And so maybe we share in some failures to lean into him. God knows. God is sovereign over your circumstances in the same way that he was sovereign over Esther's. We are character players in the story of God. And his sovereign hand will reveal that. The question is, whether or not we acknowledge his role and we do as Esther did and never say his name, we will see that the sovereign hand of God guides the heart of his people. My urge to you is, use the name of God. Whenever you can, bless people with it. Encourage people with it. Lean on it and trust in his sovereign hand over your circumstances. Your circumstances are not greater than him. Since he doesn't just know, we know this. God's not just sovereign. We know that he cares. He cares and he's invested in our lives. He's not bound by our circumstances. And maybe, so here's one of the ways that we can recognize God's both invested and caring, but he also calls us to live beyond what our circumstances allow, okay? Do you think God cares about what's going on in Texas right now? I I do. I think God's deeply invested in those people and their suffering, and he wants to meet needs for them. And so you see people wanting to give generously, right? And you may be sitting there thinking, yeah, dude, I'd totally give generously. If I wasn't broke, I would do anything, right? I would give, but I'm sorry, I have spent too much or I make too little and I just can't. But what if God says to you, be generous, Be generous because in them I'm invested and caring and you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Be generous even out of your poverty because am I not Lord of your circumstances? Can God not provide even where we don't see ends meeting? Oh, it gets super uncomfortable there, doesn't it? It gets super uncomfortable there. What if you're a little bit like me and and my family? Like the schedule just seems like, you know, like it spent a month at Golden Corral. It's pretty plump. Like you're like, I don't know how we're going to do this. It just seems too full. And God says, you know what? Volunteer here. Invest your time and life into shakeout for the kids. You're like, God, I can't. I'm busy. Is he not God of your schedule? Is he not Lord of your circumstances? We better not use the name of God as an excuse for His per- not participating in his purposes. We, the people of God, are called to see beyond our circumstances and see into the very heart of him who called us by his own name. The next thing is this. God is just. And this is where it's hard because we just talked about a just God And there was a hydrogen bomb detonated in North Korea yesterday. And they're saying they have tips, nuclear or hydrogen nuclear tips to their long-range ICBM missiles. And for the first time in about a generation, the United States sits under a nuclear threat again. And it feels strange and it feels uneasy. And we've been in a 15-year war in Afghanistan. and, And it just seems like there's this boiling chaos and turmoil. And we begin to go, oh, God, what do I do? And God says, am I not Lord of your circumstances? See, here's what happens. When we begin to fix our eyes on our fears, our fears own us, don't they? And when we don't believe that God is just, our fears own us. Let me ask this way. Anybody here ever have something in your closet late at night that you knew was going to eat you and this was your last night on earth when you were little? Yeah, some of us. Okay, none of you had ghosts? All right, whatever. Don't lie in church. All right, so laying in bed. You look and the closet door's a little open, usually isn't. (gasps) What's in there? I think I saw eyes. And you lay there and you're like, he's gonna reave my soul from my body. You're terrified of whatever's in the closet. It could be a Cinderella dress-up dress, but you don't know. It's in there and you're scared, terrified, and owned by this fear. And you wake up in the morning and you see in there and you're like, it's no big deal, it's just Cinderella. You know, and you're fine, right? But we as Christians do the same thing. We live in fear that God won't vindicate us, that God won't protect us, that our circumstances are greater than him. We have to be people who understand what this means for us today is not only are we not bound to our circumstances, we're not bound to our revenge. We're not bound to get even with anyone. We can trust it to God. And we can actually do as Jesus said and bless those who curse us and live into an ethic that brings about the kingdom of God presently for us because we also know this. He keeps his promise. He keeps his promises. 
What has God promised to you? God makes promises all throughout Scripture. What has he promised you? I mean, let's be honest. He promised us that if we're going to follow him, we're going to take up a cross. So we know that the Christian faith hurts. It's not just a gimme, 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 God is a vending machine. It's, it's a life of discipleship, and it hurts. But what other promise? That he will never leave you, and he will never let you go. What if God has promised us that it's okay to come home, return to me, for I am slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and I relent from sending calamity because I love you? What if we believe that God keeps his promise, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, no matter what happens in our circumstances? We have to be a people bound to the identity of God and not owned by the circumstances of this world. Because if we're owned by the circumstances of this life, we will find ourselves absolutely useless for the purposes God had in our life. Your life is meant to reflect this ethic. We never heard the name of God in the book of Esther, but out of the story of their faithful living, the traits of God came up. What if they said that of us one day? What if one day they said, you know, that church was a little weird and kind of crazy, but here's what we learned of God in their existence. How legit would that be if we were faithful to God as he revealed himself through our broken lives? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that your life and your daily living is supposed to tell the gospel story? We must be people bound to him who is faithful and good, but also him who is sovereign and just and the keeper of promises. We have to know that for you and I, he is invested and caring, and he's not going to give up on the lives he redeemed in us for his purposes. There is no sin you have committed that he can not, not only not forgive, but redeem your life into purposeful living. Don't be bound by that which has no power over the blood of Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, in this, the only hope we have is you. So we ask, would you take and be for us what you've been for generations past? Would you be the God who is sovereign and invested, caring, loving, just, Lord over our circumstances and the keeper of promises? God, we ask, would you be everything we could never attain? Would you be the God you've showed yourself to be, but not just for Esther. Would you do it in our lives and help our lives to tell the story of your faithful goodness, generosity, and redemption. And then may we share it freely with all who come. It is in the only name that we will trust that we pray these things. In the name of Jesus, amen. It's time to put into practice what we know to be true, that this sovereign, invested, just, promise-keeping, loving God has called you according to his purposes. He's called your life to do the very same, very same thing he called Esther's life to do, to be the means of salvation for many. Your life is to preach the gospel at all times. And as Francis of Assisi said, when necessary, use words. Your life is to be lived in the power, in the authority, in the humility and the servant-hearted nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will tell you this, it won't be easy. It will be profoundly risky. It will hurt at times. But your life is called to preach the gospel. And in preaching the gospel, we know this, that the word of God never returns void. So I invite you to start this new year with a renewed focus on who your Lord and Savior is and what he has asked of you in the relationship you have with him. As you go faithfully living with Christ, knowing him and making him known, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace in a crazy, chaotic world that knows far too much craziness. May the peace of Christ be worn on you like a garment. My friends, it is time for the church to leave the building. You are dismissed.